Welcome to CS4510. I think this is 10 2, and this is on the recursion theorem. So, last time I briefly mentioned that there exist programs which can print their own encoding. This is not obvious to do, and it's actually kind of a cute exercise. So, you could try and do it yourself first before I tell you an answer. Something like this doesn't work. So, I'm going to use a Python like syntax. Uh, let's say S takes on uh, something, and I'm going to fill it in later, and then I'm going to say print S. If I copy and paste this into it, it would be like S takes on, open quotes, uh, S takes on, open quotes. The program would not be, it would be an infinite program. It doesn't make any sense. We would have to do uh, something creative, something a little tricky, and it's kind of cute when you see these examples. I'll post one, uh, the Python example of a program which computes its own source code. You cannot, it takes no input as well. You can't uh, write a program to read in its source code and then just print that. It cannot take any input. These are called quines. Zipster doesn't use this word, but that's, they're named after a guy named Quine, which is a very weird name. Uh, but that's what they're called. So just, you can, perhaps you can believe me that one exists. We can construct some quines out of human syntax. So, or I should I should say English syntax. Uh, here's one. Print this sentence. If you were to execute this program. The output would be the same sentence. But here's a very catchy thing. The word this here is like the this here is self-referential. It's talking about the object it is part of. Now, we're smart enough to understand semantically what that means. But can you do that with like a Turing machine? Not necessarily. The this part of the sentence doesn't have an obvious translation into a programming language. Here's another example. Print the following with the second time in quotes. And I'll put a colon here. Print the following with the Second time in quotes. So this would be a valid quine. You pretend you're like a programming interpreter or whatever, and you're trying to understand. It. Print the following with the second time in quotes. So you print this string, then you print it again, but then you paste quotes on it. After you've printed it, then it turns out, oh, that's actually the program source code. So this program doesn't have hard-coded its own encoding. You can't do that. But with some trickery, it computes its own source code and then prints that. Now it's a useless program. It doesn't do anything. But the fact that these exist is, is noble in itself. So what we're going to do is kind of argue that uh, turn this English syntactic program into a statement about Turing machines. We're going to make a Turing machine to do this. And we're going to call this B. And B is going to uh, print out A. And A is going to print out B. B is going to have left on the tape an encoding of itself. Using that, it's going to print A and paste A before it. So let's call this A. So A will uh, print a B. Uh, B, knowing the encoding of itself, which A leaves on the tape, will compute A and print out uh, the encoding of A and the encoding of B. So A is going to run first, hand off the process to B. B is going to then compute A. Then it has B and A, it's going to compute AB. So it's going to compute its own encoding this way. So 
So A runs first. Prince B. Hands control to B, which and I said it'll 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 compute A and it'll print out B. So now let's go through the argument. A is the Turing machine with no input. So A takes no input. It prints out the encoding of a machine B and it passes control to B. This is not a complete definition because A does not know B yet. We haven't talked about what B does. So we cannot really finish the definition of A until we just talk about B. So B, so B, by the way, cannot just print out A. If A prints B and B prints A, this is sort of a logical, like circular definition. That's not allowed. But what B is gonna do is on input, it's gonna take in a, uh, some machine, it's gonna construct a machine to print M and we're going to call it A. So it constructs a machine A which prints out the string M. Right now we haven't used any machine property. Assume just B takes on an input string and then constructs a machine to print that string. Combine M and A. Print A, M, and halt. So here's, again, because this is tricky, let's go through the process exactly what's going to happen. Step one. A runs. Prints B on the tape. Excuse me, the encoding of B on the tape. And B is here as defined, which takes as an input a uh, machine, constructs a machine to print that string, and then prints it and halts. Two. Then it passes A passes control to B. Not the B on the tape, uh, but B as the machine, as the process. B initializes then with what on the tape? With what B halted with on the tape. Uh, excuse me, with A halted on the tape, which is going to be the encoding of B on the tape. Four. B computes the encoding of A, combines with what's left the encoding of B, to form the machine AB. And it's this combination, by the way, involves this process control handoff as well. This is not just two pasted together encodings of a Turing machine. This is one Turing machine which does A, then it does B. The process handoff happens. Uh, five. Uh, B prints A, B, and halts. Okay, so that's the proof. This is then A, B is a machine which prints its own uh, encoding. Is a TM to print its own encoding. This satisfies, last time I asked, I, I mentioned uh, for Rice's theorem, we needed one Turing machine which accepts its own description, which accepts only its own encoding. 
to satisfy the non-trivial property of the of the viruses of Turing machines. This would be that machine. Now on to uh, the the big theorem, which is called uh, theorem the recursion theorem. In human words, any TM can obtain a copy of its own description and compute with it. So the Turing machine has a self-reference. The this part of the sentence, right? In our first example, I said print this sentence. That doesn't make s sense, but with the recursion theorem, it does. It can say I obtain a copy using the recursion theorem of my own encoding. Then I check if I had seventeen states or not, or whatever. Something like this is possible. As Sipser uh, defines it, there exists. Uh, functions are from sigma star to sigma star uh, described as Turing machine R. So this string of the, the encoding of this Turing machine represents the computable function lowercase r. And then there also exists a function t which takes on an input. It's actually uh, double parameterized. It takes on as, as input two strings and outputs a single string. Uh, such that the computable function R on W is equal to T on the encoding of R on W. So basically, R is just itself but with its own description. So T computes with its own description somehow. So the proof is actually very similar, which is why we proved uh, the existence of a Turing machine which, pro which prints its own encoding first. Uh, we're gonna construct Turing, uh, the we're gonna construct R in, in three parts. So we're gonna build R from a TM's uh, A, B, and T. So A is going to print uh, BT. It's going to pass control to B. Uh, then B computes, as defined earlier, computes the encoding of A. And combines uh, with uh, a with BT combines with BT to make uh, ABT. Uh, then it's going to pass control to T, whatever T could be. That's it. Instead of halting at when B is done, it just passes control to the Turing machine T. And T is then the Turing machine for this function, by the way. So any Turing machine can obtain a copy of its own description and then by the recursion theorem and then compute with it using this trick. So here's an example of proving the existence of a, uh, a program which prints its own encoding. So let, uh, we'll call it M on... Uh, no input, so I could also say on input W, erase W, this would be fine. On no input, uh, by recursion theorem, uh, put M on the tape. Halt. So M prints its own uh, encoding here. Easy. So, 
M prints M. You might think that the recursion theorem sounds kind of useless, actually. This is like, you know, who cares about this? I need to write code. Uh, this is kind of useless. But it's actually an incredible tool for proof techniques. So it gives us, for example, a shorter proof of certain things. For example, I'm going to prove to you again that ATM is undecidable. We recall we proved this by reduction. You can also prove it by diagonalization, like the halting problem, but uh, ATM is undecidable. Assume to the contrary, uh, we'll say the Turing machine A decides ATM. Uh, let's define our, our contradiction then. Define B. So B does what? On input, which is any word, obtain uh, the encoding of B, run the decider for ATM, B comma W, on A. So we're going to write, I could write this as A of uh, B comma W. Right? So if uh, A of uh, B comma W accepts we reject. Else, so this would be this because it's a decider. This is this branch will also always be taken, which means a of a on p comma w will reject. We're going to accept. So, uh, so consider b on input w. B on input w is going to pass it to atm, and if atm accepts, b is actually going to reject. So that means A was not correct if B accepts W. Now, on B on input W, suppose that B rejects W. Then ATM says it would reject, but then B accepts. So again, we have another proof that ATM is undecidable. Here's a final interesting application, which is called the fixed point theorem. If you know anything about other mathematics, fixed point theorems are pretty common when you talk about continuous functions and things, uh, but this is one for computable functions. So uh, let uh, T, and this is Sipser's notation again, that's T of sigma star to sigma star be any uh, computable function. Then there exists uh, F uh, such that F is a Turing machine, F is a Turing machine, and uh, the, any computable function on this Turing machine describes a Turing machine equivalent to F. If this were like a different math class, I would have described it as there exists uh, X such that for all F, uh, F, F of X equals X. That's called a fixed point. Here's the Turing machine, F on input W, obtain via, of course, what else, the recursion theorem, the encoding of itself, F, uh, compute T of uh, F using its own encoding. Now, T is anything. This is true for every computable function. It obtains you G, 
we'll call it uh we'll, we'll say it outputs the string g and g is a description of a turing machine and then uh run uh g on input w since f really simulates g they're the same right g and the turing machine uh the f of t of f excuse me t of f so since f simulates g and t of outputs g really t of f and f are the same this is quite a philosophical result we have an understanding of animals producing other an animals things give birth and you know we have children and and so on but machines we never really understood them to to produce offspring right any uh machine that makes other machines such as a 3d printer you would have to think that a ma uh for machine a to produce machine B, and I'm not talking here about Turing machines, I'm talking in general about machines. You can think about 3D printers or some sort of automated robot uh, car manufacturer facility. For machine A to produce machine B, uh, you'd think uh, the complexity of A to be far greater than the complexity of B. Be far greater than the complexity of B. Somehow the description of B has to be contained in A, so therefore A must be more complex than B. But this is not true, because machines can print themselves, as we've demonstrated. They might not be particularly interesting or useful. A car might not be able to make uh, other cars, and cars seem pretty useful. And a factory can't do anything besides make cars. So it's kind of a, it's kind of interesting to think about.